Welcome to The Forgotten, a member of Episodic Network. Season 2, Episode 11, A Hostage to Fortune. Joe Kennedy had one last big public appearance before his first withdrawal from public life. He testified in the congressional hearing, which had been assigned the provocative number 1776, about Lend-Lease, where he, as he had in his radio hearing, managed to talk five hours. I mix it up, he did not talk five hours on air, but rather in this hearing, without really saying anything. Upon a question by one representative whether he knew any other method to help the British win the war against the totalitarian regimes, he just responded, I certainly do not. He then continued to say, I do not want to make any suggestions because I do not know what I am talking about. After that, he effectively vanished from the stage of national and international politics, and now he appeared back at home. He had seen that the future of the Kennedy family was in their many children, and he intended to groom them for their life to come, as he had done with Joe, Jack, and, to an extent, his daughter Kathleen already. Robert, Bobby Kennedy, was a brilliant student who had already been excellent when he visited a private school in England. Edward Ted Moore Kennedy, named after Eddie Moore, Kennedy's most trusted friend and right hand, came more after his brother Jack, He preferred sports over academic pursuits, which had a tradition in the Kennedy family. Back in England, he had failed to connect to any people and had been alone at school, something which his brother, Robert, tried to counteract by spending a lot of time with him. They shared a close relationship through both their lives. It is widely considered that it was the frequent uprooting, he had changed school 11 times by the age of 10, that caused his problems with getting to know people. The family moved once again. This time neither office nor business was the reason. Instead, Joe just wanted a change of scene and move away as far as possible from the chaos and intrigues of Washington. By November 1941, he had officially moved to Palm Beach, Florida, into a beautiful compound he had purchased in 1934 already. The warm climate, the vicinity of the sea, and the lovely nature pretty well suited him. He completely stopped talking to the press and retreated into what Nassau describes as a universe surrounded by adoring children and golfing buddies. It was pretty much obvious who Joe thought to be his most important son. His eldest, Joe Jr., after conceding defeat at the DNC, was, after Kennedy was informally dismissed from public politics, on his second year at Harvard Law School. Yet him and his brother intended to join the armed forces, something that Joe did approve of, After all, he thought they would be drafted anyways once the war started, something of which he was convinced of at this point. While he was still an outspoken isolationist, he was very well aware that his voice was not going to be heard anymore, so he adjusted his demeanor and language to a manner more suited to the gentlemen's clubs. His many contacts helped him secure a position for his sons, which he thought a suitable tour of duty for their possible public careers. Joe Jr., after concluding his Harvard year, joined the Naval Air Force as an officer cadet in a special unit. It was a little more difficult with Jack. His medical problems, constant back pain, and in general rather slim physique, might have disqualified him from military service. But with a father like Joe Kennedy, all of that did not matter too much. He joined the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington. Then, without Joe expecting more from this direction for only one second, it came crashing in. The day of infamy, followed four days later by the declaration of war from Germany, made Joe's worst fears come true. On December 7th, only five hours after the president himself was informed, Joe cabled Roosevelt in Washington. How did he know so quickly? Well, it is to assume that some contact in the White House had informed him. Sounds dubious, right? The message simply said, Dear Mr. President, in this great crisis, all Americans are with you. Name the battle post. I am yours to command. Joe, in his own vanity and convinced of his own importance, expected to be called to Washington at once, 
Yet Roosevelt claimed to never have received the telegram and was only weeks later informed by a congressman of Joe's readiness. He never corrected his mistake, of which I believe it was done on purpose and Joe remained on the fence. Joe Jr., after running an officer's training course, was sent to a patrol bombing squadron which hunted submarines. Jack, however, got into more trouble, and this was the first time it happened because of his legendary sex drive. After successfully breaking the marriage of a famous columnist, the Navy decided it was best for him to move across the country to a naval yard where he was trained on a type of ship he would command, a torpedo boat. Joe once again offered his services to Roosevelt via telegram, and this time was even offered a job. Roosevelt roughly alluded that Joe might take a subaltern position in one of the shipbuilding commissions that popped up across the country, but the offer incensed Kennedy. He wanted to be commissioner, nothing else. The refusal then again incensed Roosevelt, who was well aware that giving Kennedy authority again might be an issue to his popularity, and Kennedy was known to be an uncomfortable subordinate. So he proceeded to bombard Joe with offers all of which he knew the proud and stubborn businessman was not going to accept. Kennedy was aware of it and remarked that FDR wanted to, quote, put me to work not particularly to help the war effort, but to help his politics, which might not have been too far from the truth. Years went by with relative calm, when in 1943 talks about giving Kennedy a job left the doors of the White House, the New York Post wrote the following, because of his... Joe's record, members of the administration and friends of it who always have been uncompromisingly opposed to Nazism and wholeheartedly for the war against it, believe that Kennedy's appointment would have a disastrous effect upon the nation and are fighting his return. But it helped swing popular opinion against Joe. Lieutenant John Fitzgerald Kennedy, meanwhile being commander of the torpedo boat PT-109, was the first to suffer from the war. During a night engagement, his vessel got rammed by a Japanese destroyer. JFK and his men were stranded on an island for six days. The Navy already had the telegram with the news of his death prepared. Finally, on the 13th of August, Jack managed to get a letter through to his family, which had not heard of him for almost three weeks. We do not know when the letter reached Joe, but he had heard of the entire thing on the radio and subsequently driven it off the road and into a field. Jack would return home in January 1944, after being awarded the Purple Heart and the Naval and Marine Corps Medal. A real war hero, who had, for the first time, toppled his brother's supremacy by seeing action first and brilliantly leading his men to safety. His health, however, having deteriorated so much that he spent the time at home lying around and not being able to move, suffered gravely from the incident. Over the course of the war, Joe befriended J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. According to Nassau, he wrote him dozens of flattering letters, just as he had with Roosevelt, and again it happened to be out of calculations. He hoped that if something should happen where the assistance or cooperation of the FBI was needed, a powerful friend would be quite useful. It is often said that Joe later helped the FBI in the anti-communist witch hunts of the 40s and 50s. I can't find any reasonable source on that, and David Nassau, his most neutral of biographers, apparently did not either. So, I guess that we can stamp this off as another rumor. Kathleen Kennedy had left America in 1943, serving in the Red Cross. Back in London, she met her earlier acquaintance, William Cavendish, by then still the Marquis of Hartington and heir to the Duchy of Devonshire. Leaving the confessional borders behind them, something which angered her father and mother a great deal, the lively young woman married the British aristocrat on May 6, 1944. A month later, the young man had to go, serving as an officer in the Coldstream Guards in the great invasion of Operation Overlord. I like to believe that because of his brother having trumped him for the first time, Joe Jr., even after having fulfilled his 25 missions of the tour of duty as a patrol craft pilot, decided to participate in the Operation Aphrodite missions. These missions had old B-17 and B-24 bombers, which were not fit for service anymore, refitted with radio controlling equipment, allowing them to be controlled from the ground. They were loaded with massive amounts of explosives and guided into important strategic targets. The crux was that the planes had to be piloted up to 610 meters of altitude and the explosives had to be armed, which was then followed by the evacuation via parachute. 
Joe Jr. commanded one of these flights on August 12, 1944. His extremely disappointed father was not too happy about him, bringing himself into danger for what he believed was vanity and the lust for glory. In an earlier letter to his old man, Joe Jr. played down the dangers of these missions and said that he would come home in September. He lied. For reasons that will probably remain a mystery for all eternity, the bombs on his plane went off while he was still in the plane. He was dead immediately. David Nasor describes the scenes on August 13th, 1944, as follows. It was a warm, pleasant Sunday in Hyannis Port. The date was August 13th, 1944, the time about two o'clock in the afternoon. Jack was home from the hospital, still in pain, neither his back nor his stomach problems resolved. He and his sister Jean and Eunice and his little brother Teddy were sitting on the porch after a long, leisurely picnic-style lunch. Bing Crosby's I'll Be Seeing You was playing on the phonograph. Rose was reading the Sunday paper. Kennedy had gone upstairs for an afternoon nap. A dark car drove down the street and into the driveway in front of the house. Two naval chaplains got out, walked up the stairs to the porch and knocked on the screen door, Ted recalled half a century later. They told Rose that they had to come to speak to her husband. There was nothing unusual here, no reason to be frightened. Priests and nuns fairly often came to call, wanting to talk with Joe about some charity or other matter, Rose would later write in her memoirs. So I invited them to come into the living room and join us comfortably until Joe finished his nap. One of the priests said no, that the reason for calling was urgent, that there was a message both Joe and I must hear. Our son was missing in action and presumed lost. Ted and the other children heard only a few words, missing and lost. All of us froze. Rose raced upstairs to wake her husband. Moments later, the two of them came back down. They took the clergyman into another room and talked briefly. When they emerged, Dad's face was twisted. He got the words out that confirmed what we had already suspected. Joe Jr. was dead. Suddenly, the sun room was awash in tears. Mother, my sister, our guest, myself. Everybody was crying. Some wailed. Dad turned himself around and stumbled back up the stairs. He did not want us to witness his own dissolution into sobs. Sixteen-year-old Jean got on her bicycle and rode off by herself to church. Jack turned to his little brother. Joe wouldn't want us sitting here crying, my brother said. He would want us to go sailing. Let's go sailing. And that was what we did. We went sailing. Kennedy, for weeks on end after receiving the message, completely withdrew himself from the public. He received nobody. He just sat in the living room and listened to symphonies of different composers while blankly staring out of the window. It has to be said that the loss of this firstborn son has to be the worst point in his life, up to this point at least. The war that he had tried to avoid at all cost had finally done to him what he feared most. He had seriously injured one son and outright taken another one. To a friend he is quoted saying, I think I have probably no interest myself in something because all my plans for my future were all tied up with young Joe, and that has gone smash. On September 16th, Kennedy still not having digested the tragedy, Marchioness Hartington, his daughter Kathleen, sent a telegram that her husband William had been killed in action by a sniper during the assault on a Belgian village. Although Joe did not really know Billy Hartington, he grieved for him and his parents, and especially, of course, for his daughter Kathleen, who had always been a ray of sunshine in his life. After coming out of this reclusion, Joe became uncannily active. On October 26th, he went to Washington for the first time in years and met Roosevelt. He met a man at the limit of his physical abilities, grey-faced and with shaking hands, as he later recalled. Joe and the president had a real talk. The best recollection of it that I've found is of course printed again in The Patriarch by David Nasor. Kennedy recalled in his notes of the meeting that he told the president that the 5% undecided vote in those states was not the independent vote but the old line Democrats, the Irish and the Italians, all of whom should be in the democratic columns but this year were off for two or three good reasons. First, they felt that Roosevelt was Jew-controlled. Second, they felt that the communists were coming into control. Third, that this group, along with many others, felt that there were more incompetence in Roosevelt's cabinet than you could possibly stand in this country. 
Kennedy paused to add that he agreed with a group who felt that the Hopkins, Rosemans and Frankfurters and the rest of the incompetents would rob Roosevelt of the place in history that he had hoped, I'm sure, to have. Roosevelt went on to say, Why, I don't see Frankfurt twice a year. And I said to him, You see him 20 times a day, but you don't know it because he works through all these other groups of people without you knowing it. Kennedy kept on, his rage and bitterness tumbling out, his complaints mounting one on top of the other, most of them old ones, some new. I am sore and indignant because of the way I have been treated, he told the president. The last blow was then Jack was recommended for a medal by all of his officers in direct command, which was two degrees higher than what he finally received. He was reduced, for reasons unknown to me, but which I suspect were because I was a persona non grata to the powers that be in Washington. The president tried to change the subject to conditions in Italy, which were deplorable, then to de Gaulle, whom he thought was a buffoon. Kennedy would not be deterred. Though the war was coming to an end, and that was good, he was consumed with fear about the post-war world. The bitter, shunned man, as you can see, had sought the reasons for his problems not in himself, but in everybody else in Washington. When he met the day after Lord Halifax, an acquaintance from London and ambassador to Washington, he continued to complain and moan over the war having him cost two sons, something for which Halifax had little sympathy. He himself had lost one son, and the other one was crippled with two amputated legs. Halifax, in his diary, concluded, I'm afraid I think he's a rotten fellow. This episode in Washington and consequent talks with Harry Truman and the head of the DNC proved very effective for Roosevelt. Joe Kennedy, whose words still had weight with many of the great campaign donors, kept his mouth shut about the subject of the unprecedented and, to some, outrageous proposition of a fourth term. As such, he was re-elected for a fourth term on November 7, 1944. During the meeting with Truman, Kennedy, according to the vice president-to-be, apparently said, Harry, what the hell are you doing campaigning for that crippled son of a bitch that killed my son Joe? As FDR passed on April 12, 1945, the nation moaned. Kennedy did not. He apparently did everything he could do to tarnish the president's legacy. Calling Herbert Hoover, the first presidential opponent of Roosevelt, Kennedy told him that he had several diplomatic dispatches in his possession that would show how Roosevelt was guilty of goading the British into the war. He never publicized them, nor did he talk about it in public, but he mentioned them and his conspiracy theory to everybody who wanted to listen to him. After the war's end, Joe was one of the very few people who did not celebrate the glory of total victory, but rather mourned the millions and millions of life lost. Whenever the war and the glory of it all was mentioned, Kennedy flew into a fit of rage. Upon meeting Churchill again after years, in January 1946, during a trip he made after losing his post for the first time to Clement Attlee, Churchill made the grave mistake of saying, at least we have our lives, to which Joe responded, not all of us. After some niceties, Kennedy left him and never spoke of the Prime Minister again. While he had befriended Truman, he still was too bitter to do anything productive for party or government and continued his ramblings about Soviet domination of the world and economic disaster for the US. Over the course of 1946, he published several articles in the Life magazine attacking the government for international peacekeeping, which he thought to be an unnecessary risk of American lives. I want to skip his life up until the presidential election of JFK now, largely because it consists mostly of ramblings, a really easy congressional campaign for Jack, during which he moved back to Boston. The only quite interesting thing about this was that he stepped back into the light of press coverage again, and his daughters went door to door all over Boston. It is also important for us to know that JFK was not always in unison with his father's political idea. Indeed, Joe turned into a conservative by definition, while his son was quite progressive. In 1948, Kathleen Cavendish, his daughter, died in a plane crash. Joe was the only family member who attended her funeral in Britain, after her mother had subsequently banished her from the family after marrying a protestant. Joe always had doubts about Jack's political abilities. After all, one of his primary worries during the 20s and 30s was his terrible laziness and his inability to pull through. 
Furthermore, he was fully aware of his son's abysmal medical condition and was very keen on keeping it a secret, as in America, health has always been an important issue in elections. Jack, however, managed brilliantly to differentiate his positions from the positions his father took, especially on the foreign commitments of the US. I deem this quite important, as Joe Kennedy, the fierce conservative, would probably not have won the election into the Senate in 1953. Joe pulled all the strings he could. He sent adjutants to the entire state of Massachusetts. He sent his son to any political meeting and any event at any location in the state. JFK would later recall, I beat Lodge, his opponent, because I hustled for three years. I worked for what I got. Whalen follows up this quote with the sentence, Work he did. But whether or not he acknowledged it, the name and wealth bestowed on him by his father made victory possible. On January 2nd, 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy announced his candidacy for the presidency at the end of Eisenhower's term. Winning the preliminary elections handsomely over Hubert Humphrey, it became apparent to any enemy that the Kennedy fortune made resisting pointless. But did it really? According to Richard J. Whalen, it did make a difference, obviously, but the political skill, the general education and, it may sound weird, the physical attractiveness of the entire Kennedy family did make one as well. Joe did not only throw out his money like a sprinkler. He was very well aware from experiences gained by several presidential campaigns where he had to invest it. In the pre-convention campaign only, he invested around half a million dollars. He funded a campaign organization which swept away the opponents of the old guard around Humphrey, supported by Truman. He personally campaigned the big donors into his son's camp. The most outspoken opponent of Joe's candidacy was the man who had would become his running mate, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He alluded to Kennedy's laziness in Congress and outright absenteeism, something which was true and infuriated Joe incredibly, and attacked the patriarch himself by shouting that I wasn't any Chamberlain umbrella man. Yet still, it was Joe who talked Johnson into accepting the nomination as the candidate for vice presidency. The plan worked, and JFK got nominated at the DNC in Los Angeles. During the presidential campaign, Nixon, JFK's opponent, dug out all the old smut about the Kennedys. Especially fervently, he used the accounts of German ambassador von Dirksen you've heard about two episodes ago. He even tried to apprehend Jack's medical record. Joe, instead, completely hid away from the public over the course of the campaign, leaving everyone guessing where he was. He worked from several offices, organized the door-to-door -door campaigning, propaganda, and rallied the support of the Catholics. He furthermore had the brilliant idea of depicting JFK as the direct successor of Roosevelt, something which, surprisingly, led Jewish voters to forget that a raging anti-Semite was behind the entire campaign. On November 9th, 1960, Joe's greatest ambition finally came to pass. By a margin of 0.17% of the popular vote, his son, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, was elected president. After the inauguration on January 20th, which, so reported the press, Joe did even shed some tears at, Joe would move towards Washington. He intended to be a shadow man behind his son, a secret, trusted advisor. Those whispered news clearly earned the trust of the industrial tycoons, but incensed the Jews and other people quite harshly. Yet, he only entered the White House rather seldomly. If his son needed advice, well, he had to come to his father's place. Joe did not work very hard, but instead tried and take care of his grandchildren. Little more than one year after JFK won his presidential campaign, Calamity struck the life of the happy old man surrounded by his grandchildren who had finally fulfilled his final ambition. On the day the president left after a short vacation at Palm Beach, where Kennedy spent the winters, Joe went golfing. Suddenly, he sat on the grass and stated that he felt ill. Being brought home, ordering his family not to call a doctor, he hid away in his room. When the doctor was called anyways, he rushed him into the hospital. The diagnosis... Intercranial thrombosis. Joe Kennedy, the businessman, tycoon, diplomat and kingmaker, had suffered a stroke. Over the course of the next eight years, Kennedy would not be able to talk more than single words, walk, read and write. His right side was completely paralyzed. According to Nassau, 
The only word he could still say was no. Friday, November 22nd, 1963. According to Richard J. Valen, the founding father. By 1.30, Rose had returned to the house and was eating lunch. In the chauffeur's apartment of the garage at the rear of the main house, a radio was playing. Suddenly, the music was interrupted by a bulletin from Dallas, Texas. Stunned by what he heard, the chauffeur ran to the rear entrance of the big house and blurted the bulletin to a maid, who in turn hurried to tell Anne Gargan. It was Anne, her niece, who had come to Rose bearing the news that defied comprehension and turned the heart cold. The president had been shot. Within minutes, word arrived that the president, her son, was dead. The third time, death had violently taken from Rose Kennedy a child she had cherished. Soon, from the presidential jet flying her son's body back to Washington, she received a telephone call. It was the new president, seeking to comfort her. I wish to God there was something I could do, President Johnson told her. I just wanted you to know that. Quickly, Rose decided that her husband should not be awakened. Once, he had kept from her the message reporting Jack's disappearance at the Pacific while he prayed for a miracle. This time, there was no hope of deliverance, but she would shield him until his ability to withstand the blow was known. His doctor was called, and he arranged to come that evening. After Kennedy awoke, his normal afternoon routine continued. Anne Gargan and his nurse took him for an automobile ride, which they prolonged so as to avoid the possibility that he would ask to watch television. When the doctor came, he explained to his patient that he merely was receiving his customary checkup before departing for Palm Beach at the end of the month. Afterward, the doctor advised the family that Mr. Kennedy was strong enough to take the news. Even so, it was decided to postpone the moment a while longer. Following dinner, Anne Gargan encouraged her uncle to watch a particularly long movie. Meanwhile, Teddy and Eunice arrived by plane from Washington. It was not unusual. One or more of the children visited almost every weekend. However, their sadness and hushed conversation made Kennedy restless. He seemed to sense that something was wrong, but he retired as usual at 9.30. The next morning, Rose went, as she did daily, to the seven o'clock mass at St. Francis Xavier's, the small white clapboard church in Hyannis Port. Later, as she and her husband ate breakfast together, he became more suspicious. His New York Times was not beside his plate. After breakfast, as Kennedy had waited in the heated swimming pool, he did not respond to the forced pleasantries of his nurses. Teddy and Eunice also attended Mass at St. Francis Xavier's and returned at about 9.30. By now, their father had changed clothes and was in his room. To Clever, they climbed the stairs and joined him. His room was furnished simply. Three lounge chairs, a bureau, a chest, and a hospital-sized, electrically operated bed. On the bureau were photographs of the family. Three large windows looked out on the lawn and the sound. From here, Kennedy often had watched his children sail and swim. After Teddy and Eunice came into the room, Kennedy motioned to his son to turn on the television set. Teddy hesitated and said the set did not work. His father pointed to the unplugged power cord. Reluctantly, Teddy inserted the plug, but as the set began to flicker on, he pulled the plug from the socket. It was then that he told his father that Jack was dead. Watching from a distance, reporters could only imagine what was occurring in the White House. At the church, they had learned that the president's father had not yet been informed. Now came a sign that he knew. Just before 10 o'clock, hours later than usual, the flag on the lawn before his house was raised to the top, then lowered to half-mast. Those who saw Kennedy in the days that followed found him bearing his grief with stoic calm. He understood what had happened. Of that there was no question. Joe Kennedy always understands, said a departing visitor. The newspapers were brought to him and he watched the final honors for his son on television. But he did not break down, even when a secret service man sitting with him wept. Kennedy, according to his friend Richard Cardinal Cushing, took the news with extraordinary resignation and confidence in God. People mistakenly thought of Kennedy as a man completely interested in accumulating money, the cardinal said, but his friend had told him that 
His idea in life was the success of his children. Now, death had stolen his success and shattered his dream. After learning of Robert, Bobby's death, on 5th of June 1968, Joe's condition worsened rapidly even more. He spent his day watching out the window, crying silently, not being able to communicate. On November 18th, 1969, the 81-year-old patriarch of the greatest and most famous political dynasty of the modern Western world died peacefully at Hyannis Port. Only five of his nine children were still alive. I like to think about, especially when I'm alone, what Joe Kennedy had thought about during the last years. Almost eight years of not being able to communicate, write down his memories, but being completely clear in mind. Did he think of his own mistakes as a diplomat? Did he finally accept fault for breaking with Roosevelt? Did he grieve his children? Maybe. Did he think of what he did to Rosemary? How he treated his wife, which, after giving birth to his last child, had played almost no real role in his life anymore? All those questions will remain unanswered. My picture of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. is very ambiguous. Without a doubt, he was a skillful businessman, if there ever was one, a charming person, a good orator, observer, and most importantly, painfully honest. Yet still... He was a fierce supporter of unfair social orders. He was incredibly vainglorious. In the years of him filling the post of the ambassador, a better man, with more experience, might have changed the outcome of history. He was brutally ambitious. His way of grooming his children for office and fame might even suggest that it was not love that led his hand, but his own ego. Upon asked about Joe's anti-Semitism, David Nassau, in a speech you can find on YouTube, states that anti-Semitism, by his definition, is something which makes you think that Jewish people are something worse, are mischievous and bent on their own profit not because of their upbringing and character, as with all other humans, but because of their blood, their genetics. And Joe, educated as he might have been, definitely was an anti-Semite. This brings me to my final point. Next to Hostage to Fortune, the collection of letters, Three books were my steady companion on this journey. First and foremost, I want to question the most critical book, The Sins of the Father by Ronald Kessler. If you look up reviews for this book, for example on goodreads.com, you can read sentences like I don't think there's any doubt about it. Joe Kennedy was a scoundrel, a philanderer, a manipulator and overall was not a very nice person. Joe was always looking out for himself first, his family second, and everyone else, well, they just didn't matter. And it exposes Joseph Kennedy for the disgusting womanizing crook he was, but that isn't the surprise. What was surprising in this book was how pro-Nazi Joe Kennedy was and the iron-fisted control he had on his children, even when they were adults. I must say, I very much disliked it. It is incredibly one-sided. The sources are sometimes really shabby, and it leaves out quite a lot. I really only used it for the recollection of Rosemary's lobotomy and to give a different view on some controversial parts of Joe's life. The author, Ronald Kessler, is well known and often criticized for bad journalism and historiography. The second book, Richard J. Whalen's The Founding Father, is something else entirely. Whenever I talked about family issues, you can assume that this book had something to do with it. Whalen does a brilliant job in showing how family life and family decision affected Joe Kennedy's life choices and vice versa. With this book, the author has given a very interesting psychological analysis of the patriarch. Last, but most definitely, not least, we have The Patriarch by David Nassau. This book, combined with Hostage to Fortune, was my main source for this series, which is probably the reason why we are sick and tired of hearing this name. Not being overtly critic and not overtly appraising of Kennedy, it is by far the most detailed book on his life. David Nassau, who had unlimited access to the Kennedy Library, of course it's something of a head start compared to the other books, but boy oh boy did he make something out of it. This book is easily one of the best, most underappreciated biographies there are. If Professor Nassau should ever listen to this, and especially to this point, I hope he will accept my heartfelt gratitude and my deepest respects. His biography gives a brilliant account of one of the most influential and controversial lesser-known people of history. This concludes Season 2 of The Forgotten. 
I hope you enjoyed the ride. If you did, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or Stitcher or giving me a heads up via the contact form on my website. If you really, really enjoyed the show and want me to make more and more with higher quality, well, you can always support my show on my reopened Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash theforgottenpodcast. Since I'm now officially a student and students are always poor and in need of money for be, uh, the podcast equipment, I would be happy about any support you can give me. I will be back on October 1st with the first episode on Salvador Allende, President of Chile from 1970 to 1973. I wish you a good day or a good night. See you next time.